start the recording here and get on with programmable. Uh, hey, wait a second. This isn't what we're doing today. Let's get the right content in here. Uh, back. We want DCS Part B. Let's try that. Holy moly. I don't know what I got going on here. Two of those. I hope this is as fun for you as it is for me. Where the heck is the other? All right, well, this little experiment I'm running is turning out not good. DCS Part B, where is it? Well, folks, sorry about this uh, little cluster. Close this. Hi, it's me. I'm back again. Let's uh, let's go back to the old way of doing things here because uh, apparently I don't have the technology straightened out to do this properly. Bear with me. Get my poop in a group here. I have faith in you, Tyler. <laughs> do ya? All right, share. All right, hopefully we're at DCS part B. Nailed it. Excellent. All right, so as I was saying earlier, uh, lots of material in here. So this basically, uh, this DCS part B um, takes you right into, takes you right into programming. Um, we talked last, last IOM about the you know the explorer window and the different features of the software and the software suites as they call them uh, that are wrapped up in in a DCS system and today this IOM kind of introduces us into a little bit deeper of how that how that system works uh, in a in a generic system um, this is why I'll refer you guys to a video of the of the Delta V system that we have um, later on in the PowerPoint here. So basically this ILM uh, goes through how we build logic using a function block uh, language, which is primarily what they push when we're talking about distributed control systems. So we look at the concept again of distributed control systems being a little bit more advanced than a, than a basic PLC system uh, and, and the fact that they generally tend to use function block programming within uh, DCS software suites. And there's different reasons for that, um, technologically wise and ease of use basically is what it comes down to. It's far more Windows based and, and you can do a lot more uh, cut and paste type of activities, which we're more familiar with because um, we've grown up basically with Windows based software. So we're going to get into it uh, first looking at uh, how communication moves between different function blocks, what different function, what different function blocks do, uh, signal quality in terms of uh, the signal moving throughout the program, and then we'll get into uh, configuring and building uh, a PID uh, control scheme. So we'll take an analog input block and we'll configure the analog input block and then we'll take a PID block and we'll configure a PID block and then we'll take an analog output block and we'll configure an analog output block. So that's the first section. And then the second section, uh, we'll do a discrete input um, block with a discrete output block and some uh, uh, binary logic control. So motor switching type of stuff, level switch type of stuff uh, where it's discrete uh, inputs and outputs. So that kind of gives you a general rundown of uh, an analog loop and a, and a discrete loop is basically what's wrapped up <clears throat> in this ILM. So let's see what we get first here. Um, objective for this ILM says that we are to evaluate DCS function block programs and communication between blocks. So it doesn't say demonstrate, it doesn't say program, uh, it doesn't say become a, a guru 
uh, of it, but it does expect us to be able to evaluate how it operates uh, from the point of view of a maintenance technician where we could go into the program and then be able to diagnose things, uh, information that is available to us from the software suite uh, of the DCS package. And that's primarily the, the goal of this ILM is for us to be able to use the information that we're going to get today to be able to troubleshoot and diagnose issues within the, the software program itself, uh, which will also tell us uh, about field devices and, and other things. And hopefully we'll see that. Okay, so we'll start out by defining what a function block is and, and how, it, how it relates to what we currently know. A function block is a self-contained block of code. So it's, I don't know how to, how to relate it, but it's like having ladder logic wrapped up in a, a little block, just uh, like, like we have here. Okay, function block programming is a graphical control language. We spoke about this before, based on PNID diagrams. So um, the function block relates to the devices that we see in the PID diagram. So we have uh, a flow transmitter. So that would be a, an analog input. We have a valve, which would be an analog output device. We have an FIC or a controller, um, which contains the PID algorithms. So these are wrapped up into what we call function blocks, an analog input block, an analog output block, and in this case, a PID uh, function block. So it relates to the PID diagram, just, just as you see here. And we deal primarily with uh, the input block, the output block, and the PID block in this ILM. So function block programming can be distributed. So we talked about this in previous ILMs. We talked about foundation field bus and how the, uh, the selling point or the big feature of foundation, the brand, uh, is that you can, you can do some of this PID control within the instruments themselves outside of a DCS system. So you don't have to buy all the rack hardware and all that kind of stuff if you've just got a small uh, little system. Um, so we know that we can do PID control strictly with, P with foundation devices if, if that's what we want to do. Um, we could also do it with a mixture of some foundation instruments and the controller doing some of the PID work as well. And we can also, uh, in another um, context here, do it entirely in the DCS without using any foundation field bus instruments at all. So this kind of covers the gamut uh, in terms of um, how you can integrate foundation. Uh, I'm not sure why we push, push foundation so much, but um, it goes from exclusively foundation to a mixture of foundation and other uh, devices to what is probably more common, which is entirely within uh, the DCS controller. So again, function block programming takes these little blocks, uh, which are typically uh, found in a library, and you just go over to the Explorer tree, and you, you find one in the library, and you grab it, and you drag it into a screen, and you connect them and configure them. And that's the general idea behind function block programming. OK, so looking at these three methods here, uh, as the ILM does here, we spend a second looking at it. what does it look like if all the control is done within foundation devices, then we'll look at uh, a combination and then we'll look at everything done in the controller. So foundation field bus control here looks something like this. We have a transmitter and within the transmitter, it's got a certain number of blocks. And this is uh, the beginning of a lot of information that you're gonna be exposed to today, um, but it's very repetitive as we move through here. So uh, again, looking exclusively at foundation field bus devices. So this is a foundation field bus transmitter, a foundation field bus final control element. And again, the benefit with foundation field bus is that it can do PID functions within its own hardware. Okay, so in this case, we're using the final control elements hardware and software built into the uh, controller itself or the, the control element itself to do the PID function block. So let's look into what's involved here. And these will be common as we move through uh, other, other devices. So within the transmitter, you're always going to have a couple of things, regardless of whether it's foundation or not. You're going to have something called a technology block or and a resource block. And the names might be slightly different, but they're both the same. 
uh, regardless of the transmitter that we're looking at. So in a field bus transmitter, we have three blocks and that's what makes it unique. It's got an analog input function block built into the transmitter. The final control element has an analog output block built into the transmitter, but it also has these two blocks here. Uh, and these two blocks are what I want to talk about for a second. So the technology block, resource block, every instrument, final element or input instrument like a transmitter is going to have these. One of the blocks is the resource block, which tells us all the information about the transmitter, the tag name, uh, you know, the serial number, all that kind of stuff. And then the other block, the technology block, is basically the, uh, the block that converts the sensor signal into the signal that gets used within the electronics, the analog to digital converters, uh, and so forth within the, within the transmitter, uh, and vice versa on the output, blo output blocks. Are. So one of the blocks is going to identify the device itself in terms of tag name, uh, what is it, serial number, uh, all that kind of good stuff. And then the other one is going to convert the electronic signals um, from what the uh, control system is using in terms of signal to what the actual output signal is, in this case, going to the valve, typically 4 to 20. So whatever goes on in here is, is going on in there, but the technology block will convert it into a signal that gets used um, in, in, the, in the field. Lots of information here. Okay, so technology block or the transducer block, which is sometimes called uh, in foundation, they call it the transducer block, reads the sensor uh, or sends changes to the actuator. So it is, it is responsible for converting the signal either coming in from the sensor and getting used by the electronics or from the electronics getting put back out to the user. Okay, the resource block again specifies the instrument type, provision, manufacturer, serial number, blah, 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 blah. Marvelous. Okay, so that was all foundation. Everything's done in either the transmitter or the final control element. And uh, don't ask me if you could do PID in the transmitter. I'm not 100% sure of the answer. I'm going to say, yeah, you probably could. Um, but I don't know that for a fact. Maybe it's just in the final control elements. I'm not sure. But I'm pretty sure uh, it can be done here or here. This block could be moved either way. I think each one of these has a block. Okay, it doesn't matter. Foundation field bus mixed with a DCS controller. So here I have a, a transmitter again. All, all transmitters or end devices are going to have these two. Uh, in this case, I have a analog input function block built in the transmitter. So that tells me it's a field bus transmitter. Uh, same with the final control element has this analog output block within it. So it tells me that it's uh, probably a final control element as field bus. But I'm doing the PID algorithm computations, oops, sorry, doing that inside the DCS controller, okay? So you can mix and match is what we're illustrating here. Um, I can take the signal from the transmitter, link it through my foundation field bus linking device into our control system, into, and then within that control system into a control module that does this math, it'll send out a signal through the foundation field bus device, linking device to the analog output function block of that uh, foundation device in the field. And then that signal gets converted basically to 4 to 20 milliamps that opens and closes uh, the valve. The signal from the analog output block has to get fed back. And that's this communication line that you're seeing here with the dots. I believe that represents uh, digital communication going back to the PID function block so that we have our set point and our output so it can do its PID math. It's, it's uh, you know, set point minus PV or PV minus set point, whatever it happens to be, so that it provides feedback so that this loop works. Long story short, lots of words just to show you that I've got a foundation device, a foundation device, and the PID done in the DCS. And then finally, here we have all our control done in the DCS. And this is most likely what we're going to see. This is what we're going to talk about for the rest of the uh, ILM, and this is the delta V basic uh, way that it works here. So I have a transmitter in the field. You'll see it does not have an AI block, but it does have these two blocks. We have a final control element. Again, you'll see the absence of the analog output block, but we still have 
the technology block and the resource block. And now here within the DCS itself, we have all the other goodies. Okay, the AI block has moved here, the PID block is now here, the analog output block is now here. All we're doing now is we're taking our information from the transmitter, bringing it to our analog input card of the DCS system. This is where the software suite resides and, and the program is. The program generates a number that gets sent to the analog output card and from the analog output card to the final control element. So that takes us to what it looks like in real life. And it looks something like this. And this is based off the IEC 61804 standard, which consequently adopts most of the structure of field bus. Field bus made it, everybody else kind of adopted it. Um, and this module is based on this standard. So this is what it looks like in Delta V up here. I have an analog input signal here that's assigned to a transmitter. I have a PID block here that's assigned to a controller tag. And we'll learn more about this as we get into the setup and configuration. And then we have an analog output block, which is assigned to a final control element. Okay, so the structure of function block programming is pretty straightforward as we saw on the other screen here. We have input parameters, which receive data from another block. We have output parameters, which send data to another block. And then we have contained parameters, which are internal to the fun to function block. So here's a generic image of a function block, and if you could call this an analog input block, a PID block, an output block, whatever kind of block it is, it doesn't matter. They have all the basic things. We have an input coming in, we have an output going out, and then within this block, we have all the other types of parameters, high level limits, uh, engineering units, scaling, uh, direct and reverse acting, uh, square root extraction, all kinds of different parameters within the block itself. Uh, the different blocks will have different sets of parameters associated with them. The block will have a block name. The block will also have uh, an instance name. So for example, a block name for uh, uh, flow controller, um, would be uh what would, what would it look like here to, let's see what we got here there we go okay so it would be the block instance would be a pid block for example and we're going to name the pid block uh fic 101 because it's a, a pid loop with a transmitter um a pid control algorithm block and an analog output block so we'd have the analog input block would be named ft 101 the PID block would be named FC101, and the output block would be named FV101. Okay, so input parameter, contain parameters, output parameters. The input block will have its own setup full of contained parameters, things like the input scaling, uh, output scaling, things like that. Output parameters, same idea. It will have its own little collection and we'll get into them individually. Okay, algorithms are programs that function blocks execute using the input and contain parameters to determine the value of the output parameter. So we feed information in here through our, uh, through our configuration of these contained parameters. It applies an algorithm which modifies this signal into our output signal to be used by the end device. Okay. Function blocks can all have modes, okay? We turn them on, we turn them off, auto, manual, all kinds of different modes for each function block. Um, the actual mode uh, and the target mode are two key modes that you'll see uh, on the screen in, the, in an operator window. And the actual mode is the current state of that block, how it is right now, and the target mode is the intended mode. So for example, if it's in uh, automatic right now, you're an operator and you walk up to the screen and you have a, the auto manual cascade switch, 
on the on the side and I, I wish i had a graphic here and you wanted to take it out of auto so you click the manual button so what we, what you would see on the screen the diagnostic screen if you're looking at it you'd see the actual mode and manual and then you see a slash and then you see auto as the target mode mode meaning that it's in between the two modes it's transitioning it's sitting there actually in manual but you press the button so it's waiting to go into auto mode why is it waiting to go into auto mode because there's certain conditions that have to be in place in order for it to go into auto um, because you don't want to upset the system uh, there's things like uh, you know uh, bumpless transfer and all that kind of good stuff we're going to talk about that um, so those are two modes that you probably haven't heard of before that are kind of unique to DCS. So actual mode is the state that you're currently in. Target mode is the mode that you wish to be in if you made a selection. As long with those modes, there's the other modes that you're probably familiar with. Manual, auto, cascade. Uh, these are pretty familiar to us. Uh, another block of them here that might not be so familiar. So manual. Um, we're going to define these in terms of what goes on with the signal. Okay, so when it's in manual, the output of that block is directly set, meaning that the operator is setting it and it doesn't change. When it's in auto, it uses a local a local set point. So fed in again also from uh, the operator station as the set point, but then it will change. Uh, in manual, it it's just set and it doesn't change. Cascade uses a set supply point. Uh, supplied set point. Remember that cas cascade uh, uses a set point of another controller as its as its input set point. So that's why it is a supplied set point. That's the definition of cascade. Uh, new one here is called initialization manual or I manual, and it's unique because I manual is a signal that gets sent um, as it's switching between modes, and it's very it's a subtle thing because when you switch modes, it happens really, really, really fast. But we talk about all of these little steps uh, in about 20 pages in the, or 10 pages in the ILM. And you, it seems like it takes a long time, but it goes through this process, click, 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 really, really fast. Um, and it goes through some of these modes uh, in some situations through two or three of these modes. So initialization, initialization manual is a new one that you'll see. And the output of that block is set in response to the beak K cal or the back cal input parameter. We'll talk about that uh, in, a, in a little bit. But basically what happens, uh, I'll talk about it in a little bit because it's a little bit confusing without a picture. Okay, another mode is called out of service, OOS, which means that the block is out of service and it's just not executed at all. Uh, the last mode is called local override, and in local override, the output is set to match attract input, and we'll define what attract input is later, um, but basically it's the input from another block, and it follows that block. It's kind of like, uh, oh, I don't even want to, I'll, I'll, I'll get there when I, when I get to the block. Okay. So talked about these modes. Now we'll talk about this communication and how it, how it goes in between these modes and why these modes are significant. And remember, the idea behind this ILM is not actually to make you learn how to program it. It's more about making you familiar with the way the information is supposed to travel so that you can diagnose issues. It's pretty hard to be a, a diagnoser of issues unless you actually understand how to program it. So they kind of go hand in hand, but the focus here again is more on understanding how it works uh, rather than being able to actually do it. It's both. Okay, so communication. Here we have our blocks, an analog input block, a PID block, an analog output block. We've got all kinds of words on here that we've talked about already auto manual target actual uh, bk cal all that kind of good stuff um, and this is what it looks like in in a configuration window when you're when you're building uh, some function block okay <clears throat> so 
we're going to talk specifically about the signal coming out of this analog output block to start with. Okay, the analog output block parameter has a both a value and a status field because we're talking about digital communication and digital control. We want to take care, uh, take advantage of all the benefits of digital control, and that includes not just being able to give us a number, but also to give us uh, diagnostic information such as statuses of uh, our information quality. So we're going to spend the next couple of slides talking about how this system recognizes signal quality coming out of a block. Okay, so the status field is composed of three parts, and if you haven't figured it out yet, this is our uh, this is oops. Jason, this is our status field right over here. So in our status field, we have three parts. The first part is a definition of the quality of our signal. The second part is a substatus, which defines our quality. And the third uh, definition here is limits on our signal. And limits on our signal are exactly what you think are limits. So high limits and low limits. Uh, based on our signal. This comes from configuration within the block. Lots of information here to, for you guys to, to wrap up. So you'll see here, uh, as we go through some of these next slides, what's going on in each of these individual blocks. You'll see that this one, for example, the target mode is auto. It's actually in auto, good for us. The information coming out of this block Looking at the status field says a few things. It tells us that our output is 10%. It tells us that our signal is good and it's a non-cascade signal. I'll talk about that in another slide. It tells us that the data substatus is non-specific. We'll talk about that in another slide. And it tells us that our data is not limited, which means, which means that we're using the full range of data available from the device upstream. Okay, then that data is coming into our next block. This block we can see its target mode is manual. It's currently in manual. It's also sending out data. Because it's in manual, something has changed in terms of the data. First of all, it's in manual. So when it's in manual, the operator has provided the information that's coming out of it, which means that the data is now constant. Okay, the operator in manual sets, oh, sorry, that's I manual. We'll talk about that later. Um, I'm just trying to get you familiar with some of the things that you'll see and why you're seeing them. Okay, so because this is in manual or I manual, the data is constant, meaning it's not changing. The output is here 0%, and this is because that's what this block is getting fed, 0%, and it's in manual, so that's what it's going to put out. The signal it's saying is good cascade. The reason that it says good cascade here and not good cascade here is because an analog input block does not have a cascade uh, potentiality. It's an input. It doesn't receive any signal, so it has nothing to do with cascade. So it doesn't mean that the signal is bad. It just means that it's not a, a cascade signal. Any block after that analog block, PID block or analog output block, you'll see has a cascade parameter, a cascade parameter, and its signal will, will, will say good cascade. This one says good cascade. This signal coming out here also says good cascade. This one's in manual. It's going to get the same signal that it's being fed, so it's getting fed zero. It's going to put out zero, just like this one here. This says not invited, and we'll talk about this in another slide, but basically um, it's saying not invited because it wants to be in cascade, but this block is not inviting it to be in cascade. We'll talk about it later. This is really, in my opinion, far more information than, than you guys should be exposed to, um, but it is in the ILM here, and hopefully me explaining these terms will help it out help you out as you read through them because uh, reading through them is a, is a bit of a struggle if you're going into this cold. Okay, so this not invited has something to do 
um, with us wanting to change from manual into cascade. And in order for us from changing to change from manual here into cascade, this has got to be invited. And we'll talk about that later. Okay, a limit here again on this signal is constant. Why? Because it's receiving this constant signal from the manual selection that the operator has set this block into. So manual mode, the signal is always constant. In automatic mode, it's not limited, right? It's, it's supposed to be going through the range and, and controlling. Lots of information, follow along with me if you can. Okay, so looking at quality, looking at the sub statuses of quality. Okay, so good cascade, what does that mean? It means that the value is good and that the blocks support cascade. Okay, here the blocks don't support, this block doesn't support cascade, so it says non-cascade. This block says good cascade because it does support cascade. This one says good cascade because the block does support cascade. The next substatus here, good non-cascade, which means that the value is good, but you don't have cascade support. So that's what we saw with that analog input block. Third substatus is uncertain, which means that the value is less than normal, but it is still useful. You just got to know this. And then finally, bad, which means that the value is not useful at all. And we'll talk about that again in the next slide. Okay, so that's the quality. These are the substatuses of quality. And then now we'll talk about, uh, I believe, some more substatuses. Okay, so substatuses <laughs> coming under coming down underneath here. So we looked at the different types of qualities, good cascade, good non-cascade, bad, blah, 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 blah. Now we're going to look at the substatuses. And I got that mixed up a little bit. Okay, so substatus, non-specific, indicates there is not a substatus or there is no substatus. So it's actually a good, it's a good thing to see that. Next one is called not connected. Not connected is fairly obvious. It indicates that the sensor is not connected. So you'd get a bad quality followed by a substatus of not connected. Don't worry. This is all building up to something that will make some sense. Okay, uh, next substatus is sensor failure, another good one, straight up. Sensor has failed a diagnostic test. It tells you that. So here you're seeing the kind of information that you get in a completely digital system. All kinds of good, useful diagnostic information that you can use from the comfort of the control room. Okay, uh, next substatus, active block alarm. So it'll tell us if we have an alarm. Good stuff to know. Uh, last substatus, engineering unit range violation. Simply telling us that our PV is outside the program engineering range. So if we're uh, 0 to 100 PSI, we're either at minus 3 PSI or 105 PSI, whatever it is, but it'll give us a substatus. What does that do? What does that mean? What does that look like? Why do we need to know all this? Uh, sorry, I thought I'd get to show you. Uh, last breakdown here, limits. So limits are pretty easy to understand. We've all dealt with limits before, I think, since we got here. So not limited straight up means that the value is within its range. High limited means that the value is above its upper range. Low limited indicates the value is below its lower range. And constant means that the function block is in manual mode and the operator has set the value. So lots of definitions, lots of terms here. Um, you know, there's, there's four spaces on the quality uh, subset or the status set. Um, so we have to be familiar with all the terms, unfortunately. Uh, okay, let's look at cascade communication. I've already talked about this. Um, both the PID block and the AO block have a CAS in parameter, okay? The CAS in parameter, cascade in, cascade in. And thus, and thusly, they can be placed in cascade mode and they can also have a cascade signal as we saw a couple slides ago. Something that is also introduced as a result of this cascading signal uh, feature that we use 
is a function called the bkcal out parameter. This is a super important parameter. Um, back cal, um, back cal out, as it's called, I think. Um, and what it does is it provides bumpless transfer and prevents reset windup. We talked tons about bumpless transfer in third year, uh, reset windup also in third year. We still mention it here in fourth year. And again, what it does essentially is it takes the output of the analog output block, feeds it back into the PID block so that if we were to switch the mode from this manual to auto, auto to cascade or whatever, it makes sure that the output signal that's going to get sent is the same as the one that is currently being sent out so that it doesn't cause an upset to the system. Um, this line actually here should be drug, oops, this this leg, I, this BK cal should be connected, yeah, but I don't know why that's written there. Okay, so uh, I don't have a slide in here that I was hoping to have. This is not cool. Let me just zip a couple of things here. Darn. All right, I was hoping to have a slide here, but uh, I don't. So let me just look at this here and refer to the ILM for a second because if you got your ILM out, and I hope that you do, flip to page nine and pay attention or bring your attention to table one on the bottom right hand side of page nine. Um, does everybody have a table there or does anybody have a table there? Yeah. Okay, I just want you to pay attention to that table because it kind of gives you uh, a one a one eyeball view of, of what these previous three slides that we looked at were all about. Um, the combinations of all these uh, statuses and sub, uh, sub statuses and, and stuff that we've talked about here are all fine and well, but unless we can kind of put them into a context, it's hard to wrap your head around. And this table on, on page nine, uh, kind of does that. So if we look at any individual signal, it could have a combination of the quality, the substatus, and the limits that we've talked about. So this table does a good job of, of representing uh, what that signal could look like. And this is also a good way for me to test your understanding um, of those terms. So for example, if I said, uh, what is the status of the control loop if the the, um, the the communication signal is identified as being good, non-cascade, the substatus is non-specific, and the limit says non-limited. And you should look at that and go, okay, well, it says good non-cascade, uh, it says non-specific, so that's okay, and it says non-limited, which means that it's reading the full range available. And I'd be able to say, well, that means that it looks like it's working just perfectly fine. If I went down to um, the third one, for example, says good non-cascade, say, okay, the, the signal seems to be good. Uh, then the substatus, it says active block alarm. Oh, that means that means I have a, a block alarm and the limited, limit says I'm not limited. So it says, tells me that the loop is working good. It's, it's reading the full range that it should based on its limit setting or limit status but it also tells me I have an alarm, so something I want to look at. The last, uh, last row uh, says the signal quality is bad. The substatus says sensor failure, and the limit says low limited. So right off the bat, I can say, oh, bad, sensor failure, low limited. But if, oops, shoot, obviously my sensor has failed. So this just kind of identifies how we how we use um, the information provided in all these previous slides here in order as a, as a diagnostic tool. Um, because you can go into the control room and sit down and look at the blocks, and it'll tell you all of this stuff before you have to go outside, climb that 120 meter vessel to find out that the wire is pulled off or the sensor has failed or, or whatever. So that table, I, I should make a mental note of add to PowerPoint. But I guess as I get more familiar with the PowerPoint, I can just bring this stuff up. 
Okay, so we did that. Uh, we looked at that and we looked at this. Did you guys' screen just change? Yes, it did. There we go. <clears throat> okay, so the next few slides here uh, walk us through what happens in milliseconds as an operator changes a control loop from manual into automatic. This is what you have to keep in your head as we as you read through the next three or four pages in the ILM. So it's it can be very overwhelming, but just keep in mind that this is what's happening. The operator is going from manual to automatic, and this is all happening within the control system in seconds. But we need to understand what's happening with that control signal. Uh, in each and as it goes in between these blocks as we as we move along okay so cascade initial initialization is the, is the name of that activity so as we switch from manual to automatic or automatic to cascade we do that process it's called cascade initialization so it refers to the communication that occurs between the blocks as the downstream blocks mode changes from manual to cascade okay so here we are uh, we're sitting here, our controller, and think of the PID block basically as our controller. We're in manual, our actual uh, manual and our target manual are, are, are both in manual, okay? Our actual and target here are, are both in manual. Our transmitter, as you'll see, it's in auto because transmitters are, transmitters are just generally always in auto. They're, they're not really part of the control system. Uh, you can't switch them really anyway, so they're almost always in auto. So what's happening here is we're sitting here, the control system is in is in manual, and I'm gonna I'm gonna switch it over to to auto. So as I sit here, what's going on in manual? My transmitter signal is coming out. It says that my signal is 10%, my my signal is good, uh, I got no issues and I'm not limited, so I'm, my full range signal could, could potentially be coming out of here if I wanted it to be, but it's currently reading 10%. That's what's coming in right now, but it's in manual, so that doesn't matter. It's gonna be sent whatever comes in from somewhere else. Either the operator station is sending me a signal, or in this case, I'm getting my signal over here, but let's just say for shits and giggles that the operator is sending us the signal and it's zero. So the output of this block is then also going to be zero. The signal will be fine, and it's going to be good cascade because I have cascade support in either of these blocks. It's going to be non-specific, which means good, and it's going to say constant. Why is it going to say constant? Because I'm receiving a manual signal, and manual signals don't change. Okay, so that's what's coming in here. This block is also in manual and uh, actual and target in manual currently. So its signal is going to be whatever it's being fed, which happens to be zero. So it's coming out as a zero. It's a good signal. It's saying that I'm not invited. What does that mean? It means I'm not invited, meaning that this thing's in manual. Its target is not cascade. So I, I don't want you to be a cascade signal. I'm not inviting you. To be cascade okay so pay attention to what happens and what happens here as we as we switch to these modes the signal itself is constant because it started out constant here and it's still constant and it's coming in constant and that's it it's constant going through here okay so that's where we were then the operator hits a button okay he changes the button uh target mode here is now going to be, uh, I don't want to get these uh, mixed up, but the target mode is now switched to cascade and its actual mode changes to auto and it's got to go through manual auto and then cascade. Okay, remember this is split seconds. Okay, the analog output block mode gets switched to cascade and its actual mode changes to auto. The actual mode of the PID block is now in IMAN because the analog output block is in auto. It's, this is overwhelming, I understand, but we're basically trying to track what happens 
what happens to the to the signal here okay so now that this signal has been requested switch to cascade it says that the initialization is requested okay so the signal here is still zero but now that this has been changed to ask for cascade it's saying i want to be cascade so initialization is requested that number is the same that data value is the same this data value is now no longer limited because i'm asking to be cascade okay it's a lot of information i, I understand but that's the way it goes okay another couple milliseconds happens and here we are the pid block now uh, initializes and changes the values of its out parameter if the value of the in parameter is good so in this case the in parameter is good and it says initialization is acknowledged so it's it's telling this block saying okay we're we're good i'm about to I'm about to give you this guy's information. Wait a split second. This is still the same because this hasn't fulfilled all. It hasn't changed yet. It's almost changing, but it hasn't changed yet. It's been asked to change. It says I'm going to change, but it hasn't actually changed. This is painful. Just ride it out with me. Okay, finally, when the analog output block receives the status that the PI block has initialized its changes, its actual status will change to cascade. Okay, so you'll see now that this one is cascade, cascade, actualist, targets cascade, actualist cascade. Its data has now changed. It's no longer limited. This is still good. This is still good. This is still sitting at zero. This is going to be sent to here. This is going to go, oh, I'm now receiving some data. The actual status of the block is now on manual because the PID received the status from the analog block that it's in cascade. However, the output is still constant. It just is. Trust me, this is worse if you're reading it by yourself. Okay, finally, the PID block can now be changed to auto and the output is no longer limited. So it's quite a process, but it happens very quickly. So our transmitter is now reading 50%. Our signal here says good non-cascade, which is fine because it doesn't support cascade. It's non-specific, which is good, and it's not limited, which is also good. This is now an auto. This is now an auto. So what do we get? We have uh, an output here reading 45%. We'll talk about that in a second. But the signal itself, quality is good, cascade, because it supports cascade non-specific because nothing's wrong and not limited because it's in auto this block cascade and cascade its signal is at 45 percent we'll talk about that in a second um it's good cascade because the block supports cascade it's non-specific because nothing's wrong with the value and it's not limited because it's in cascade which is a, a an up of auto and it allows variable signals and that's being now fed into our bk cal signal why is our output 45 percent uh that's probably because something happened inside the pid block so a lot of information in there to wrap your heads around um that was probably deeper than i've ever talked about um that data quality identification and the whole process of what goes through here oh i'm so scared to answer this question michael but go ahead you know when we're in a plc programming uh if the uh function function block diagram or ladder uh, diagram if it's not running they have color coded here for this case if anything goes wrong such as bad or a low limited uh, would this be color coded as well so um let's let's be realistic here you're 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 gonna see any problems that occur in the operator windows rather than in the programming windows right so if on an operator station for example if you have a high limit alarm there's going to be a red light or a or a 
horn or something that's going to tell you that you're out of limit. Uh, there's going to be, uh, you know, an analog scale showing you how much the valve is open or how full the tank is or any of that kind of stuff. Um, that's where the color coding kind of comes in in the HMI portion of it. Um, is this color coded in the program control studio itself? You know what, I, I'm not sure, but I'm, I've got some slides that actually use uh, the Delta V later on in this presentation. So we'll, let's look for that as we go, as we go through. I don't remember them being color coded. So we'll have to wait and see. Okay, so that's just diagnosing the signal and showing you how the signal travels um, as, as we switch modes and how that affects the information going between the blocks. And, and remember, it's, it's all about being able to go from manual to auto or auto to manual without, without causing upsets in the system, right? So keep that in the back of your brain. Okay, so holy moly, 10 o'clock already. How far to uh, page 14? Okay, so now we got to do some programming. We understand the basic idea. We grab an input block, we grab a PID block, we grab an output block, we, we connect them together, we set some parameters, and it starts doing some control. It's all based off a of PID diagram. So let's look at kind of what that looks like. <clears throat> so in the DCS, a control strategy is typically referred to as a control module. Uh, and it's a module, uh, you'll, you'll see why it's a module. Um, again, I said it's very Windows based and you can kind of go and grab, grab things and cut and paste. And they actually have, they have modules and you, you can really go and you grab a PID module and you drag it over and you drop it into your screen. Uh, you have an analog input module and you go over to the menu and you grab it and you drag it to your, and you drop it into your screen. So in this PID loop, for example, we would have control modules for LI-101. We'd have a control module for FC-101. We'd have a control module for uh, the HC or the handoff auto station or the ESD station for this, uh, this valve. Uh, we'd have a, uh, a module for the stop start of this motor 101. So this diagram here, LIHC, uh, inside the square block here says that this is a software, uh, this is a software function is what that means. Okay, so different control modules is, is how we program the DCS. Okay, so let's look at how we do this. <clears throat> level indicator control module. Programming a level indicating control module involves some steps. First, we configure and program the analog input card, then we program the function blocks, and then we program the control module. And the reality of it is, is this is kind of all in one process. And we'll, I'll show you a video at the end of this here, and, and we'll show you this. So if we were in the lab, we would do this, but we're not. Okay, so first thing you're gonna do, and this is, this is kind of generic, but fairly similar to what you get in the lab, uh, we started with an analog input card. So I'd go in here to the library and I could find uh, a module and then I would rename that module LI and then I would start building it. But let's see what happens. So here I have an analog input card. Uh, it's in the controller one, uh, rack one, card one, channel one. So your controller one, rack one, card one, channel one. And that's, that's the addressing for that I.O. point. Uh, this little piece of information here says that I'm looking for the data called field value percentage, which means that whatever I'm measuring in the field here, uh, zero to 100 degrees Celsius is coming out here as a percentage, zero to 100%. And most standard transmitters work that way. Okay, so that's an end of my input. Go ahead, Mike. For those uh, uh, physical devices, I/O card or uh, uh, analog card, when the card plugged in, will this automatically recognized by this uh, studio, or we have to assign the equipment? 
Yes. Um, we do it so you have to assign it, but it will pick up devices as you connect them. Uh, and that's kind of the cool thing about Delta V um, is it will literally, as soon as you power up a new loop, you connect it to a channel and you power it up, it will go, hey, I just detected a new, a new input device or a new output device. Do we want to configure this? So yes, it will. Um, but we we walk you through the program. We walk you through the process of assigning uh, individual I/O to individual channels so that you guys uh, can understand how to do that. Um, and also, I'll, I'll point out, and that's again probably a dangerous amount of information. While you'll see an address like this attached to, for example, this analog input block. The reality of it is, is this would this would say TT101. It would have a, a block name of an analog input block. But this down here, when, when we did our database configuration, and usually when you set up a control system, you'll take all your inputs and all your output tag names, and you'll program them all in at once. And you'll say channel one is TT101, channel two is TT102, TT103, TT104, TT105, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are called alias names. And then they show up in here rather than this long address. And it's a lot easier to understand, but that's neither here nor there. Okay, so first thing we have to do is we have to bring an analog input block over and then we have to configure it and, and address it. Okay, then we gotta grab, uh, oh, sorry, uh, this is analog input block programming. So inside that analog input block, we're gonna use some parameters and there's far more parameters in there than uh, you need and far more parameters than you'll ever understand. Um, but there's about four basic parameters that you're gonna have to know. Okay, so there's input output parameters. These are all the different ones that you can choose from. Um, but basically the ION field value percentage, those are the most common ones. Uh, if you're using a heart device, um, there's specific ones that you can use for heart, but you have to do something to tell the input what type of an input you're giving it. Okay, then there will be parameters associated with signal conditioning. So uh, filter time, scan time, uh, direct, reverse, uh, square root extraction, things like that. Uh, there will be parameters associated with alarms. So high limits, high, high limits, low limits, et cetera. Um, and then there'll be modes for that particular block. So manual and automatic, uh, in the case of an analog input block, uh, it has manual and automatic modes, although it's 99.99999% of the time, and transmitter is always in an automatic mode. Okay, so these are just the things that have to be programmed and configured in that block. Okay, so different variables. I'm not going to work your way through all of them, but these are the typical ones that we're going to use in the labs. Uh, read these. I'm going to stop talking because I'm starting to get lightheaded. Um, but be, be able to be able to tell me what these ones are because these are, these are the ones that we're going to be using in the labs, and they're the ones that I'm most likely to ask you about. Okay, uh, module programming. So after we program a control module and we assign the different parameters to it, we have to save it and assign it to a controller. Then we have to give it an execution time, tell it how often we want it to, to gather information and execute. Um, also assign that information possibly to an HMI display. So if it's a temperature transmitter, we might, might want a, a bar graph on a screen so the operator can see what the temperature is, or we might just want a number on a screen or whatever, but this is uh, what we have to do uh, when we're programming it. <clears throat> and then uh, also history and or alarm detection uh, needs to be programmed. So we want to tie it in, tie that information, tie that transmitter, tie that address to our alarm database or our historian database, which is a server that stores all that information. And we talked about that earlier. So part of programming still. 
Okay, flow control module, uh, same idea. Configure and program the I.O. cards, program the function blocks, program the module. Uh, I think I'll just show you the video at the end and you'll see how this works a little bit better. Okay, uh, here's an analog output card. This is the card, or I guess this is really an image of a channel on an analog output card. So this is all inside the card, one little channel. We connect our valve here with two wires. This is our valve, and it ties into our, our uh, marshaling cabinet. This is our termination. Uh, in the marshaling cabinet, there'd be a termination here, and then we'd connect to the two screws, these two screws here on the actual card. So this is what it looks like, analog output card. Two screws, just as we would probably imagine. Nothing exciting to say there. Okay, so what do we got here? Uh, flow controller 101, analog input block programming. Not gonna be any different than the programming that we looked at uh, for the LI. Uh, we're gonna pick what type of input signal it is, some kind of parameter dealing with the scaling, uh, some type of parameter dealing with uh, the type of signal, and some type of parameter dealing with the uh, number that's coming out of the block. So this deals with the number coming into the block. This has to do with scaling. This has to do with uh, converting or filtering, uh, conditioning that signal. And then this has to do with how we want it to look going into the next block. Um, important thing to know is that whatever comes out of this block in terms of uh, how the signal is defined has to be the same going into the next block. So if this is sending out 4 to 20 and it's configured for 4 to 20, this has to be configured for 4 to 20. If this is configured for 0 to 100, and most of them are, wink, wink, this has to be configured to accept zero to 100. If this can configured from 50 to 150 PSI, this has to be configured for zero or 50 to 150 PSI. They have to match. Same here. This has to match this. This has to match that. This has to match this. And this has to match that. Keep that in mind. Okay, so analog input block. Again, lots of words. Same thing we did with the LI configure these things. As you read through the ILM, you'll see that they're different. This is a flow transmitter. So this parameter here probably has some square root extraction attached to it because it's a flow transmitter, um, probably a differential transmitter. And those are the things you want to go through. I think this, this walks you through a whole bunch of different examples. Okay, analog output block we haven't talked about yet. So look at the parameters for an analog output block. We have to uh, configure the, uh, the type of IO signal or that type of output signal. We have to configure the CAS in, the BK Cal out, and the BK Cal in. So you'll see that most of these things are the signals uh, that we see. Okay, signal conditioning again, similar parameters, PV scale, output scale, a new one here called IO readback. I could talk for weeks and weeks and weeks um, about these different parameters, but um, as you read through them, you'll see how they how they vary slightly between the, the different types of processes. Modes, uh, in this case here, uh, cascade, automatic, and manual. Okay, very wonderful stuff here. PID block. So how do we how do we program the PID block? What things do we expect to see? So these two analog input, analog output, fairly, fairly similar. PID block, it's got a it's got a few things of its own. Okay, so we got to configure the IO, IO in, in, out, IO out. So all these wonderful values here. We'll drill into these a little bit deeper when we get into uh, something that's more realistic and less generic. Okay, signal conditioning again. The other blocks had signal conditioning. Uh, control settings, this is new. This is unique to the PID block. So here you'll see we've got our gain, our, our rate, and our reset values to so our PID settings in this block. Um, alarms. So 
We saw alarms in our analog input block. We also see alarms here in our PID block. When you read through the ILM, um, you will see at least two mentions uh, where it says, if you have the option of setting your alarms in the PID block versus setting them up in the analog input block, please set them up in the PID block. So more of, long story short, and I'm not going to get verbatim on you, but the reasoning behind it is there's more options and uh, variability in alarm setup in the PID block than there is in the analog input block. Okay, uh, final, uh, last but not least, modes for a PID block include in the initialization manual, uh, manual, automatic, and cascade. So again, a uh, good set of questions here for multiple choice questions. Um, in the analog input block, what modes are available? This one, this one, this one, that one, or this one, this one, this one, that one, that one, that one. And you would know that in uh, an analog input block, you can only have manual or automatic. Uh, an output block can be manual, automatic, or cascade, and a PID block could be all of the above. Okay, programming, you've done all that thing, you set all your parameters, your PIDs, all that good stuff. Same as the other blocks, you have to save it, save it, assign it to a controller, give it an execution time, assign it to a HMI if that's your desire, uh, attach it to the uh, alarm and or history uh, data acquisition system if you require. So same, same. Oh boy, anyone need to take a break yet? We're, we're close to the end, but not too close. Okay, here's, uh, we're gonna roll, we're gonna go forward here because I think I, I think I paraphrased a lot here. So this is the transition point now from analog to discrete. So we're gonna talk about uh, HC 101, hand control station 101, which is a safety shutdown valve control module starting on page 34. And I believe this is a two or three or more page description here. Let's see here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So this is the next dozen pages. This takes us to the end of the ILM. Um, but this is looking at discrete inputs and discrete outputs and a couple of other blocks that are used to process <clears throat> those information pieces. Okay, so um, programming the flow control module. Again, I should have probably included the picture, but I didn't. Okay, so that's the way she goes. Uh, discrete input card, here's what it looks like. Yep, it's a card, it's got two screws on it. We connect a switch some kind of an input, flow switch, level switch, temperature switch, pressure switch, whatever it is, discrete switch. And all this goody, all this good stuff is inside the card. Okay, output card, same deal, except here we've got a solenoid valve or a motor contactor or something like that, some discrete output. Okay, so here we're gonna look at HC 101 uh, safety valve with feedback. So this allows for an operator to open and close the valve. It also closes the valve if level switch high high is tripped and alarm if the valve does not reach its expected state. So a lot of things going on here, especially when you looked at this for the first time an hour ago, but here's what's going on. So. I have a digital input or a discrete input block, and I have uh, this new block over here that you see called DC. DC stands for device control block. Okay, so in this case, we're, we're naming it DC1 for device control block one. Our discrete input one is named DI1, the block name, digital input, discrete input, whatever it is. Uh, and device control. So what parameters are attached? They, they show up here on our screen. So we have our IO in here is an input that's attached to uh, card three, channel one, and it's giving us a field value. So discrete field value, a one 
or a zero. Where is it getting it from? Uh, we're getting it from LSH. Uh, we're getting another signal from LSH2, okay, which is giving us a field value, a one or a zero. In here, I've got a ZSO, so an open switch for the valve, a ZSC, which is a closed switch for the valve, and then I have an XV101, which is an output to the solenoid valve. So more than one thing uh, that we see going on inside this block. So these are values that get parameters, uh, parameters that get adjusted and set when we configure this block. Don't worry, I'll give you a good reading in the ILM for you. Okay, so the following parameters are used for the device control block. So different ones in here. State masks. This is confusing uh, at first. Um, what I'll tell you is passive means no electricity and active means electricity or non-energized and energized is a good way to look at passive and active. Uh, again, these are parameters I, off the top of my head. Uh, I don't know actually everything about all of them, uh, but some of them, the CFM Act one time, this is uh, how long does the switch have to be uh, activated before I acknowledge that the switch has been activated. So this is a way to get rid of switch chatter. So this is, you set this one second, two seconds, three seconds, 10 seconds. And it says that if the switch gets made, I will acknowledge it after three seconds in case it accidentally shuts off again and is going up and down. Okay, device options. Uh, I can't remember what that one is. Uh, IO output, IO input one, IO input two. So these will be, uh, those two ZSOs would be configured in here uh, and the XD would be configured in here. I'm, I'm not gonna walk you through what you have to read anyway. Okay, state masks. Uh, this is a little confusing. I hope the graphics got fixed uh, in the ILM, um, but state masks are basically a, a way of indicating within the program what my input and output devices are doing uh, in the field. Okay, so the state mask parameter needs to be programmed and we program it as follows in this case here. And remember, wrap your head around uh, the situation that we've, that we've got. We've got a, uh, an operator station that can open and close a valve. And then we have switches on that valve that tell us if the valve is open or closed, right? It's an emergency valve. Okay, so in the passive state or de-energized state, input one will be false. Okay, input one, uh, our input device is our, our ZSO and our ZSC, right? So when the valve is de-energized, which means that it's probably failed and closed, it's got no electricity, the closed switch should be uh, one of the switches anyway, I'm not gonna make it confusing, but one of the switches will be open and one of the switches will be closed, okay? And that's what you, that's what you see here, okay? So this passive output, this is our XV or our solenoid valve. So we're saying when our solenoid valve is de-energized or passive, one of our switches is also de-energized and the other one should be energized, right? The valve is either open or closed, one switch, should be open, one switch should be closed if it's at either end of its travel, okay? If I energize the other, the solenoid valve, does that, do I have a slide for that? No. If I energize the solenoid valve, meaning I make it active, this dot will move from here up to here, and these two dots should switch. My valve should go from being closed and the closed switch showing on to open and the open switch showing on. I hope that's a good description because it took me quite a while to wrap my head around that concept. So just passive de-energized, active means energized is a good way to remember it as you read through it there. Okay, um, if we were gonna do DCS lab two, we would do it in the lab, but I highly doubt you guys are gonna get to do this. Good news is there's videos, so you'll be able to, you can watch it if you want. 
Okay, um, summary here. Function blocks can have the following permitted modes. Manual, auto, cascade, IMAN, auto service, and local override. Communication between blocks involves sending both a value and a status. And we know that the value can be um, constant or it can be not limited. And we know that the status can be way too many things. Some of the function blocks used for analog and digital control include the analog input and output blocks, the PID blocks, then we have a line, and then we have our digital input, digital output, and device control blocks. And we're talking about discrete stuff. State, ma state masks on the device control block initiate alarms if the inputs are incorrect in the passive or active state of the block. I normally would have got a question here from Michael, but he didn't ask, why do we need to know this? Because if we hit the shutdown switch, right, hit the ESD and the valve's supposed to close and it doesn't make all of its stroke and the open switch is no longer showing that the valve is open, but the closed switch is no longer showing that the valve is closed, we have no way of knowing. So that state masking will allow us to set an alarm if that switch isn't in the state that we expect it to be in based on the XV. Thanks for asking, Michael. So um, a, lot of, a lot of information in there. Uh, it takes a lot of seat time to really wrap your head around all of the things that are going, that are going on. Uh, in the VCS programming. Um, I am going to put up a video right now. You feel free to watch it later if you want. Um, it's in, uh, I'll show you one more time where it is. Course content, uh, labs, control systems, video links, and really, you could watch all of these labs, to be honest with you. Um, but the one that would make most sense today is if you watch this. Uh, hmm. This one right here, PID block setup, would make the most sense for what we covered today. Um, if you were going to watch these in order, I'll, I'll rename these later and I'll put them in order. But if you wanted to watch them in order, um, probably log on, version control, analog input, PID block, and then, uh, oh, geez, I haven't looked at these in a while. Anyway, long story short, I'm going to put this video up right now if you want to watch it. If you don't feel like watching it, you can leave and watch it on your own. But I do strongly suggest watching it because it, it puts uh, everything we've talked about today into uh, real life, uh, and, it's, and it's pretty good. Maybe, maybe we'll just do uh, show of hands, or you can shout out if you want to watch it now, or if you'd rather watch it later. Ray says you'd rather watch it now. Okay. Yeah. All right. If you don't want to watch Again, if you don't want to watch it now, you can uh, you can log out and leave. I'm going to stop recording on this lecture, and then I'm going to start the, the video. How long is it? Uh, about 12 and a half minutes. <laughs>